sure why I'm really here. I'm not a nurse. I'm not in the medical field at all. And I've noticed that they kind of put me at the last, um, as the last person, which kind of speaks to, I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> I don't know. Because everything I'm going to talk about is basically around um, social work and working on the downtown side. And I really want to say that I absolutely love uh, what Sheila was talking about. I just like, you know, like, it seems like forensic nursing is so much aligned with uh, social work in a, in, in a way. Um, and, I, and because I had like two different messages about what I was supposed to be doing here, I'm really not prepared. I was under the impression that I was supposed to come and talk a little bit about um, some of my passions around um, Indigenous studies. And then when I was, you know, I thought, well, I'll just double check that. And I sent Conrad an email. I'm like, what is everybody being told that they're supposed to be talking about? <laughs> right? He's like, are you talking about your work? I'm like, okay. So <laughs> I'm hoping this is going to be like a really, you know, because sometimes people say, oh, speak for 15 minutes. And I say, oh, well, that's not very long. And in my case, I'm hoping that it goes really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of mindful of the time here. Um, but I do want to um, make some acknowledgements about um, being on Coast Salish um, unceded territory from the Musqueam to Salish Truth. I have fun, pronounce that difficulty. And um, the Squamish people. And I think that's really important. I've, um, I'm a Métis from uh, Manitoba, and I don't know if you guys know much about um, the Indigenous people of Canada and some of the history. I, um, I've been working in the downtown east side for 19 years, and when I started working there, I, I, I basically made, came in as a peer worker. I didn't have a lot of education, um, but I knew a lot about the struggle of um, impoverished women, marginalized women, uh, because I was one. However, I wouldn't have used that terminology. Um, I thought um, at the time that the experience that I had um, would open a lot of doors. And actually, when I look back, it wasn't a lot of experience at all. I just really knew the resources well, and I kind of knew how to work the system really well. But as I started to get more involved in my work, and I heard a lot of terminology which I didn't really understand, at the time, kind of like patriarchy, you know, legislative poverty, you know, marginalization. And I really didn't understand what any of those terms really meant. But as, as my years passed, I, I came to understand them in a, a totally different capacity. One, that I was, I, that was and fit into all those categories. And, um, and that it was going to, I think, really make me much stronger in the work that was going to unfold for me because I, like Sheila, had really no direct path. I just knew that I wanted to work with women who were struggling and I didn't really know how that was going to unfold. I ended up getting employment with the YWCA of um, Metro Vancouver, uh, Crouchy Corners, that's located in the downtown east side. And the majority of the women that access the Women's Resource Center um, experience extreme barriers and poverty, and um, and that and that was um, that was perfect for me. As as time went on, I, I got more education. I went to um, VCC. I went to um, Douglas College. And now I'm in my third year at U of M doing the distance program along with in a more in a private institution called ClearMind International. Basically, uh, what ClearMind is is that they teach you therapeutic practices like counseling skills and primarily focus on um, the family system. So my studies at U of Vic, um, my specialization is Indigenous, and what this I, I just felt that this was really ironic. About a year ago, I, um, I did some family genogram work, and I don't know how many of you have done family genogram work. And I was really, really, can anybody put their hand up? Anybody done genogram work? So I don't know what your experience was like, but it rocked my world. Like, I just can't tell you what it did for me. Um, one thing about being um, indigenous um, 
is that I grew up with a lot of shame about being Native. And in my family, there were a lot of family rules that I originally interpreted as being shameful. Like, don't talk about being Native. Don't talk about being Indian. Don't tell anybody you're Métis. And when I, when I completed my family genogram work, I had realized that those, when my caregivers gave me that information, it wasn't to make me feel shame about who I was. It was actually to protect me only because of the nature of how Indigenous people were treated, um, especially, well, all through the country, but especially for the Métis people in Manitoba. It was really interesting that through my studies at VCC, or at um, UFIC, I've, um, I've learned how to be Native through a textbook. And you know, that, in some way, it's funny, but it, it's also really painful, um, because that's how so much of my own culture has, has been watered down, not spoken about. So I'm in a place right now where I'm trying to honor that and honor myself. And so that brings to mind, it brings a number of things to mind. One, it brings to mind a, a term called internalized racism, and another term about, um, no, I can't remember what it is, sorry. Oh, sorry, intergenerational trauma. It's not like I, I don't talk about these things all the time, it's just like, with so many people looking at me, I feel like sorry. But, I, when I first heard the term internalized racism, I didn't quite, I didn't understand what that meant. But when I looked it up and, and saw that it was about taking on and being the hate that I saw and dealt with and my family members dealt with, I, it resonated with me. I totally understood why I disliked myself so much and why, you know, I always would put myself down first before somebody else um, and why I carried that shame about being native. And really what I'm doing today is a really is really about changing that view because now I look at it differently. I don't look at it as a bad thing. I actually come, you know, and talk about it with a lot of pride and esteem. And I do that in my work. I work with a lot of indigenous uh, people. And I am trying to work within a system that has been extremely oppressive. And it's I work with a lot of I, I, I run a couple of groups. One of the groups I, I run is an intergenerational grandmother's group, and they are raising their grandchildren with fetal alcohol spectrum uh, disorder. And and I I have to say I'm a little bit surprised sometimes that you would think that once somebody knows that about colonization and oppression and that you can have a choice that you don't have to you know live your life a, a certain way that it's it's colonization is. So ingrained and so rooted. Like here I stand here, I've been colonized. I've been assimilated into the uh, what I call the Canadian state. And um, when you have, um, when you know that you can actually do something different, it's so ingrained that, that you don't, you just accept it as it is. And I, if, when I'm working with my grandmothers, I find that like well, the majority of them have gone through residential school, and this is really common for them. They, they. When I bring stuff about indigenous, you know, like ceremonies, I try to honor their, their, their different bands and the, the different nations that they come from, and I talk about traditions, and I talk about some of the culture, and I try to implement it into the program, but I know I wasn't raised that way. Not interested. Actually, in some instances, they don't really care. And for me, I, I thought it would be like I was bringing something new, and that they would be excited and would be on this big bandwagon of change and you know working from a decolonization perspective. And it doesn't work that way. And I have to say, I'm a little bit surprised. But um, one of the things I did want to talk about before I run out of time, I do want to tell you a little bit about my job. Um, <laughs> Six minutes left. I wanted to tell you about a few books that if you're interested in learning about um, Indigenous studies in Canada. The first one is The First Peoples in Canada by Alan McMillan and Elton um, Yellowhorn. This will give you everything you want to know about Indigenous people in Canada, from the minute of, of contact to 
what's going on currently right now. Right across Canada, it goes across. It tells you about all the different nations and the, how strong and, and prideful and um, how rich their cultures were and then what happened to them after colonization. Um, the other one is, this one, you guys might be, you know, I, would, I think it might interest you because it has to do with the health profession, is um, Molecules of Emotion by Candice Perth. It talks a lot about the theories right now of how um, intergenerational trauma is getting passed down um, and how it's in the DNA. I think that is a super, super topic. I'm totally interested in it. This one, Decolonizing Trauma Work I Brought With Me, is by Renee Linkletter, and she also talks about that. I'll just read something out of the book. She says, and Sheila would probably be very interested in this. Trauma is also intergenerational and multi-generational. It is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over time that is transmitted from one generation to the next. I didn't know. When I did my family genogram work, I saw, I went back two generations, three generations, I saw how my family system had been impacted by um, colonization and, um, and how it was really destructful. Really destructive. I grew up in an alcoholic home. I I was impacted by trauma myself. I couldn't learn. I didn't actually start learning until I was in my 30s. I'm now 55. And I just wanted to just share with you a little bit about the work that I do. I'm leaving some pamphlets because this is really important. This just isn't uh, um, an indigenous problem, although some people think it is. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I'm sure you guys are going to run into a lot of it in, in your profession. I don't know if it's covered in your studies. Anybody? Is it? You guys know? Okay. Um, I, although I've been in my work for 19 years, the first 13 years of my job, as I was uh, the, the community outreach worker, and that entailed working with a lot of single women and, and children in parent education. Um, advocacy, working with um, with women, primarily women who were um, having to deal with the Ministry of Children and Family, working with a lot of single women who were trying to get uh, persons with disability designation, um, advocating for them, working within the family court system, um, and supporting women to you know um, feel good about who they are, to to be that voice that listens. I worked in a detox center for five years and I came into contact with nurses and I was just absolutely blown away and touched by the level of compassion that you guys have. Like I, I have to say that I, I like have stolen some of the, the tricks that you guys use. <laughs> I use it in my work too. Because it's so, it's so, like some of my friends are nurses and, and the level of compassion you guys have is totally wonderful. But anyways, the three years I was in management, and now I'm the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder coordinator um, at my job. And in the last nine months, I've learned so much. And the thing about um, FASD is that, from my perspective and other people I've inquired with, I'm like, so we hear the term, we kind of get a general idea about what it is. It has to do with women who. Um, Consumed alcohol during their pregnancy, and and I'm still I'm still learning that you know it's it's not that it's not so much the amount it could be you know the genetics involved it could be you know there is no damage but there is no safe amount of alcohol when a woman is pregnant, and a lot of the things that I do with this is. What I do with it is more the behavioral. I'm, I'm, I'm working with mothers, trying to find ways to help them, one, deal with the guilt and shame that they feel. Two, is help them strategize of ways to help their child through a positive lens. Some of the signs that you guys might see if you were to come into contact with a child and sometimes, you, some, sometimes people have FASD 
and you can't tell. Sometimes there are more severe cases of it where it's really noticeable. But if they're going to have a, have a slow physical growth, there's um, heart defects, so they have a small head circumference, there's major problems with sensory. They can be hyper and hyposensitivity. That means that even the slightest little brush can actually hurt them. And there was the um, hypo. It's like there was a teenager who his friends were, were found it amusing that they could burn him because he didn't have any, there was no, he didn't feel the pain sensation. Um, they have difficulty planning and working towards a goal. And they have number of different social issues that you guys may see in your work. And you may wonder why this person keeps on coming back um, to your healthcare clinic. Uh, 